we've been talking about for a while. I was able to speak to many of the program directors over the past couple months about potential residency collaboration. And the idea I heard a lot was, what if we could connect our residents together in a shared learning community? Wouldn't it be amazing to connect with people who are just as excited about the physical therapy excellence as you are, people who sharpen your iron? So this is our first, hopefully of many, residency hot topics. It's a forum for ortho and sports residents and faculty to gather, to discuss hot topics, connect with this growing network of excellence that we're a part of. Our first hot topic is running analysis. So the way this will work is, your invited experts will spend the first 20 to 30 minutes exploring the questions that we put in the original invite. And then we'll open the floor to residents so you guys can ask difficult questions that you wrestle with every day in practice. You can use the raise hand feature or throw questions in the chat. I will do my very best to make sure all of your questions get asked and answered to the, to the team. Um, so the questions we'll be covering are what are the value of apps and softwares to enhance my running analysis? When and why should we do 2D versus 3D? What are some keys and pitfalls that experts in running analysis encounter every day? So your experts are from left to right, Dr. Scott Greenberg, a driven sports medicine professional over 24 years of experience at University of Florida, professional athletes, Olympians with a focus on injury prevention, rehab, sports testing, sports performance, photoorthoses. He is the manager of operations for UF's health department of rehab and director of their sports and ortho physical therapy residency programs. He's also an invited educator on national and state levels, membership chair of the American Academy of Sports Physical Therapy, and was previously the chair of their running special interest group. Doug Adams is a physical therapist who's published and spoken at an international level on all things related to running. Doug has taught thousands of professionals his systematic approach to providing personalized plans for runners through certified running gait analysis and endurance running coaching courses. He also designed and created a portable 3D motion analysis system called Helix 3D for analyzing and categorizing running form that's used widely throughout the Department of Defense and commercial sectors. With no further ado, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you, Ben, you so, so much. much for you. Yeah, yeah I appreciate you being here and all the guests as well. Really uh, appreciate everyone taking their time out here. This is uh, a dedicated group to helping the profession grow. So honored to be part of this uh, really interesting event here. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. I echo what D Doug said. And, and Doug and I both teach together quite frequently. So we have our little dog and pony show. Um, mm -hmm. It's not usually in, in this uh, in this type of setting, but we're going to go back and forth. Doug and I see eye to eye on a lot of things. And there are some things where we kind of don't disagree, but we have we come at it from a different viewpoint, I'd, I'd say. And, uh, and hopefully that can get brought to the forefront today um, and we can highlight some of the things that I like to do, some of the things that Doug likes to do, some of the things that I have at my disposal on a day in, day out basis, some of the things Doug has, has his hands on on a day in, day, day, day out basis and, and kind of try to make this a very um, informal, my hat, you know, my sweatshirt, Doug's attire, you know, more of an informal kind of learning panel discussion type of thing today. Uh, allow you guys to ask questions and hopefully we can come up with some kind of answer, whether it be true or made up. You know, we'll, we'll kind of try to try to try to keep you on your toes there. But um, but no, this is a topic that that Doug and I kind of talk about frequently. Uh, we we have both a lot of experience treating runners um, over our years and we've both had success and we do it kind of differently. So that's kind of unique and interesting. And I think hopefully everyone here will get something out of that. Yeah. So I always like to kind of, we had everyone say where they were from, but um, kind of a show of hands for the clinicians out there. I know some might be more on the education or administrative side here, but um, who's done a gait analysis in the last month? How many people have worked with a client? Show of hands there. All right, there we go. I'm seeing hands populate, so I like it. I like it. There we go. So that's good, right? We're seeing so far about 11 or so of the uh, 12 or so of the, so about a quarter of them have done that. So that's that's good. Um, as we're going through this, I would, you guys, once you put your hand, you can put your hands down now um, just to make sure that that function is working, but thank you. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, to me, 
I am a little biased about gait analysis, but I think it should be the same in, in commonality as doing a goniometer or handheld dynamometer that we are getting objective data about what we are doing. Um, gait is an essential developmental process and it's an essential movement to life. And whether it's walking gait or running gait, I think there's an essential aspect of it that we need to be understanding it and taking to a higher level. And that um, I think Scott and I would wholeheartedly agree on this, that if you get an athlete coming in, whether they're an athlete that runs or whether they're a running athlete, I think that we would say uh, the absence of pain is not function uh, with that group. And if you just do mobility and strength and uh, look to improve that, we know that we're not going to get the same results. And things that Scott and I share in courses that we teach together a lot of times, you know, the sayings of mobility is not ability and stability is not ability that you can't just strengthen somebody's hip abductors and expect that they're going to have a reduction in collapsing uh, contralateral pelvic drop. Um, I think that that's pretty widely accepted now, but I think that we're still catching up as a profession on how do we really affect change in there. And that's where gait analysis is an important part of that. So um, Scott and I are going to be talking a little bit back and forth about 2D versus 3D. And I thought I think we, we don't have many slides uh, with this at all, but I just wanted to give a little background about 2D. Um, and maybe uh, poke at Scott just a little bit with some of this stuff here. So I'm going to start uh, hey, sharing before my start, screen. Before you start, can I just talk about yeah. one little thing? I'm going to talk about one little thing first. Um, right. Whenever I whenever I talk about you know running and running injuries, um, I, I talk often whenever I give one of these type of things about you know why pain occurs. And if you break it down into the most simplest form as to why pain occurs in any situation, it's when the stress on the tissue exceeds capacity, right? So in the running athlete population, we start thinking about that equation, you know, stress greater than capacity equals pain. And our goals are to increase capacity and decrease stress, right? So how do we increase capacity? We increase capacity by getting people stronger, allowing them to recover a little bit better. We fill their tanks up a little bit more by decreasing intensity and decreasing frequency, right? Those are all means in which we can do that, but we can also decrease stress that way too, right? So um, other ways in which we can decrease stress, I call it the shifting load approach, right? What is a shifting load approach? The shifting load approach is tasting, taking stress from one body region and, and really moving it to another. Because again, there's no change without compromise. There's no change without consequences, right? There's oh, if you make a change, some other tissue is going to bear the brunt of that. And hopefully, in our in our assessment, we're able to move forces and stresses to tissue that's more capable of dealing with it. And that's going to vary from day to day, from run to run, from um, you know uh, activity to activity. But really, like if I wake up today and and I am on my feet all day long, and I go to run at the end of the day, my tissue may be more fatigued than if I were to run first thing in the morning. So what you're capable of doing one day may not be what you're capable of doing the next day. Um, nutrition plays a part in that. Um, but we can shift loads actively via things like gait modification. We can shift loads passively by things like orthotics. We can shift loads by using tape. Again, all have a, have a, a place and a time to utilize. Um, the amount of time in which you implement some of those, those, um, those things, different shoes, put different stresses on different parts of our body, right? So all of that has a time and a place. And Doug and I are gonna talk about, you know, is there a perfect running form? You know, that's obviously a, a very common question we get asked all the time, and there may or may not be. But regardless, we know that by changing how somebody runs, we can move stresses along the body in different areas to better hopefully deal with some of those demands and overuse injuries that we commonly see. Yes, and I agree. Like. 100%. That, that's such an important aspect of it, too. And I think something that Scott and I, we teach courses together, um, you know, certified running gait analyst. And I think that a big part of that, too, is that understanding that what Scott just said, that there's no one way to do that. And each runner, even each occurrence that we see them is going to be very uniquely different. And the whole goal with treating runners is to find a personalized approach that can help them out. I think one of my um, favorite running studies, um, and I can get this reference, it's, uh, it's evading me right now. Scott, jump in if you, um, 
I can't think of the author's last name, but it was from 2022. Um, and it was on managing bone stress injuries. But it was that basically, if you can reduce the stress of each step by 10%, a person can run twice as far before the body's tissue structures will break down. So when we talk about gait analysis, it's Scott and I aren't talking about trying to make it perfect. We're seeing where can you find that 10% that's going to make that much of a difference there. So um, that that's a big part of it is how do we really just get that that basic aspect of it and do that. So I'm going to take the stance a little bit of the 3D, uh, you know, 3D for life and, and 2D once in a while too. Uh, there, I'm, I'm a little bit more on the extreme for this talk, but Scott and I see a lot of eye, eye to eye with this here. Um, ben already gave us some great introductions, but this is, I'm a huge running nerd. I uh, work with professional athletes uh, all the time. A lot of the runners had the opportunity to do gait analysis on some of the fastest runners in the world this past year. Um, help them to get uh, to where they want to go. And it's just gait analysis is a critical piece of the puzzle, not the only piece of the puzzle, but something that we should really be looking at there. So um, I like to show this graphic for if you're thinking, hey, is, is 2D good enough? Well, we can look at Prince William here and say, uh, is getting part of the information really serving me as best as it could here? And if you look at the top picture of 2D, looking at from the side, it look like it can be a big, uh, big middle finger there. But you look from a different angle here, and and you're really able to see a different perspective on that. And that's, I think, when we're just talking basics about 2D versus 3D, kind of kidding aside, that that really is a, a major advantage of the 3D in that aspect is being able to look in multiple planes at any given moment. Um, in synchronized view, being able to see exactly what's going on. Um, that's not to say that uh, there aren't valuable 2D measures that we can look at and we can identify. Um, and Scott will probably touch base on some of those, so I'm going to let him talk about that. But the really the role of the 3D is that we're able to get the whole picture, to see in all planes of motion what's going on, how is the, the hip and knee and low back, how are they contributing together, how can we see transverse plane, frontal plane, and see all that information that can really help us get to that individualization. And I think it's also now very much more approachable in a clinical setting. I think if we did this talk even five years ago or so, we would be saying, well, you know, 3D is great in a research lab, but is it much more applicable in a clinical setting? So, um, you know, full bias opinion here. This is a system I created, but it's it's very quick and easy to use in a clinical setting. So this is one example. There are other systems out there just of a portable system, um, optical based. There are some uh, markerless based systems coming about that um, are very expensive and, and not quite accurate enough yet. Um, but there's existing technology that's really focused on making this as clinically relevant as possible, where with in as little as 10 seconds of running, you're able to get exact information to be able to tell somebody what drills should we be doing? What strength training should they be doing? Um, how can we put together a training program and plyometrics? Everything that goes into healthy participation with running, how can we really look to incorporate that in in a way that athletes will really be able to uh, incorporate into their day-to-day -day activities with that and making it easy for them. But like Scott was saying, actually, um, you know, it, it, that's part of it. And the value of the 3D is trying to pick out what is this individual in front of me? What do they really need? What are What's their unique running injury profile? This is something that we talk about in our courses here. Um, what are their movement capabilities uh, from a mobility and stability? What is, what's the running form look like? What shoes are they using? What surfaces are they running on? Are they stressed? Um, do they have a lot of experience running? Are they ramping training load? All of these things matter. And if you can increase somebody's ability to participate with a 10% reduction to let them run twice as far, that's a huge factor of it. And I just hope people coming away from this will see that gait analysis is as critical as taking a measurement of somebody's knee range of motion after a total knee replacement, that we should be looking at these things um 2d is available now i think that was one of the biggest drawbacks was the expense and the um the ease of capturing the data but now that you can get live or nearly live data um we should be striving to get as much information as we can without overloading the person so that we can really understand exactly what they need to do for that 
person in front of us there. So uh, that's my quick uh, two, three minute uh, 3D talk here. We'll let Scott do his 2D and then we can kind of maybe rebuttal back and answer any of the other questions that we had uh, for the for the conversation as well. Sure. So thanks, Doug. So when you're doing like, obviously, Doug has a, a wonderful setup there and, and it's wonderful if every clinic could could deal with that and get get that in their clinic and play with it. Um, we know reality that's not always the case, right? So what does that mean? Does that mean if we don't have a 3D system, we shouldn't be treating runners? I don't necessarily believe that's the case. So Doug can, can throw up his one finger to three finger thing and I'll just throw the one finger right back at him and say, you know, in, in, all, in real world, it's just not applicable, right? We, we, we've got to be able to treat these runners and just because we don't have, you know, and again, Doug's system is very, very, you know, affordable based on what the technology is, but it, you know, not everybody has $20,000 or whatever it is, give or take. Um, and Doug can, can tell you exactly what it is, but I'm just throwing a number out there. Um, you know, $15,000, not every clinic has that, right? But I will guarantee you that 99.999% of the people that are treating in the clinic have an iPhone in their pocket that can do what they need to do. And if you throw another $15 at the table, you can get yourself a tripod. You throw yourself another $5 a month, you can get an app, let's say, that does uh, some of the things we're gonna talk about. And uh, it's pretty inexpensive to kind of get get you on your way and treating runners. A lot of what we're going to be doing, yes, Doug has wonderful reports. His system is is gets a lot of buy-in from his patients just based on the setup alone and and the and the capabilities of the the reports that are being able to be driven from it. Um, but at the end of the day, if you can educate your runners and tell them and show them that you know what you're talking about, um, that goes a long way in all of this. So. How do we how do we set this up right so we got to make sure number one i said you have some kind of video capable uh device whether it be an iphone an ipad um you can get a video camera recorder you need to be shooting at at least i'd say greater than 60 frames per second i think that would be the bare minimum of where you want to be shooting at just so that you can actually slow it down and see what you need to see you know the human eye i think looks at somewhere around 30 frames per second or less and that's just not cutting it. It's not good enough. You're going to miss stuff if you're just looking by the naked eye. So you do need to have, to have some kind of camera capability to slow it down. Um, the, the systems I use over the years, to tell you how old I am, I used to use a system called Ubersense, right? Ubersense morphed into Huddle. Huddle morphed into Onform. And every step of the way, I've lost all my videos that, that they've kind of, as the company's been, been buying them up. So um, it's the never ending battle. But there's a lot of different systems out there. Darkfish has a system, obviously. I've been playing with a new one recently um, through the MyJump app. They just they have MyJump 2, which is great. I use in the clinic all the time for looking at like vertical jump height and force and power and and um, and basically concentric versus eccentric phases of jumping. And they've kind of expanded it to it's called like the MyJump lab now, and they'll do running stuff. They'll do some running asymmetries. They'll do some running biomechanics. So it's it's kind of a neat little thing. A lot of a lot of companies are coming out with markerless um uh apps that you can use on your phone that will will give you angles without you having to draw them um and i think the technology with that is is getting better and better so um again uh make sure the area is well lit make sure you have a consistent um distance if you can from where your camera placement is to where the runner is treadmills are obviously best because you can see multiple angles Treadmills that don't have the arms coming directly down in, in, in view of your camera view is obviously something to think about. Woodway makes a great treadmill. I have a treadmill in my house called Soul. It works great. Um, so I, I have some videos of that I'll show you in a second. So well lit, constant, consistent space, um, be able to go from side to side, front and back. Um, I tend to do 90% of my work looking at sagittal plane mechanics. So I'm on the side of the runner looking at sagittal plane mechanics, and I'll go over what those are. I then will infrequently look at the posterior side the, from, the, from the back and from the front, actually, um, because I believe, in my experience in doing this, that if you can make big changes in the sagittal plane, a lot of the frontal plane mechanics will take care of themselves. So sagittal plane things I'm going to look at is foot inclination angle, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about tibial inclination angle. We'll talk about knee flexion at initial contact. We'll look at something that I've deemed hip flex, uh, hip separation angle. Um, we'll look at um, the knee window. Uh, we can look at pelvic drop. I typically don't measure that 2D. I don't think it's very accurate, especially when you start looking at markers on clothing and everything else. It's it's tough to do, um, especially if you don't have markers. It's even tougher. Um, and then you can look at some upper body stuff. But but really, the the thing that that 
that has shown in some of the studies we've done, even in our labs, is looking at the the inter and intra-rater reliability of knee flexion, for example, on 2D versus 3D. And I think our inter-rater reliability was was um, was fairly high using Huddle, and um, comparing it to the lab was also extremely uh, extremely um, uh, worth using. We'll call it. I think it was greater than an 80% of uh, of um, intra-rater reliability with that. So. Uh, anyway, it, it was a it was definitely something that we found value in. So I'm going to share my screen and let me know if you guys see it. Thumbs up. Yeah. All right. So this is this is um, I have about four videos of different levels of runners. OK, this is a high school runner. Uh, I'm going to show you how I marker them up, what I'm looking at. Um, if you're going to watch this runner, they are not um, a very they're very shuffly in nature. We'll see. Okay, and tell me if you guys can see this. Very shuffly, um, not a long stride, not not big circling through the legs, I like to say it. They're driving forward with their arms. They're kind of using a lot of transverse rotation through their arms to drive them forward as opposed to using their legs to really propel them forward. Um, as the video moves, I think we'll see, yep, slow, slow motion. We'll see that they're landing out in front of themselves, but not, not by much because their stride is so short, right? So shorter strides allow for a, a landing more underneath the center of mass, which is what we're always striving for, but which again, I think helps with um, loading capabilities, but I don't think this person's gonna be a very high performer on the track or uh, on the cross country course. Um, they are landing, as you'll see, out in front of themselves with an, uh, a foot inclination angle, um, with, with, which indicates more of a heel strike. So it's basically the foot uh, angle from the heel to the forefoot, in line with the uh, parallelness of the treadmill. So that's the angle we're looking at there. Obviously, I like to shoot for something that's relatively close to zero. The yellow line is what I call the tibial inclination angle. And because her stride is so short, she's got a pretty good tibial inclina inclination angle. You want the tibia to be as vertical as possible. The next thing we're gonna look at is knee flexion angle. Knee flexion angle, I like to have about 30 degrees of knee flexion at initial contact. Hers is obviously less than that. Um, She's just not absorbing shock super well. And then this is the hip separation angle. And in my, in my years and years of doing this, I like for hip separation angle to be around 30. And hers is around that, again, because her stride is so short. Um, the problem with her gait is that it's very, very shuffly. It's very front and back. And there's not a whole lot of front side mechanics. She's, a, she's more backside mechanics, I call it. Um, so what I would like her to do is I would like to, to get her a little bit more of a shock, in a shock absorbing position to get her a little bit more bouncy. And again, I'm just putting that circle in there to show that I've identified that her arms are, are moving more in the transverse plane. Hard to measure transverse plane um, in 2D analysis. There's no denying that. You know, Unless you're on top of somebody um, from above or below them, you're going to have a hard time kind of looking at true transverse plane mechanics. The next video I'm going to show is the same girl um, with a little bit of cueing. Again, same day, not saying this is ideal but just a little bit of cueing changed some things, okay? Some of the cues that we wanted her to do, I wanted her to circle, I wanted her to bring her knee underneath uh, or, or bring her heel underneath her butt a little quicker. I wanted to think about the, the, the cue I like to use is riding a bicycle. So you can see that she's landing a lot more underneath herself. She's landing with an ankle that's a little bit too plantar flex in my opinion, um, but you can see her hip separation angle is really zero or very close to zero. Um, when she's hitting the ground, she's a lot more compact, but she's a lot more springing in and a lot more athletic, I'd say, with her with her mechanics. The thing that we we tend to see with with distance running is injuries occur when they're when their foot's in contact with the ground. And her contact with the ground, we could have measured it, um, was a little bit longer than I like. Um, because when you're in contact with the ground, that's when you're really loading. When you're when your foot is circling or in the swing phase, you tend not to have as many distance running related injuries. That's when sprinters tend to have their problems, right? Due to the forces and, and whatnot. But um, you can see her knee flexion hasn't changed much. Her tibial angle looks good. Her, her hip separation angle is significantly better, obviously. Um, so we've got her landing a lot more compact. I'd like her to still land a little bit more supple at the knee. Um, I would probably continue to cue on driving forward and back more with her with her with her um, upper extremity as opposed to rotating as much through her thoracic spine. But you can see in literally 15 minutes of tra at training, we've changed her gait form. 
to me, this looks a lot more athletic than what she was doing before. And again, a lot of what we're looking for is trying to make somebody athletic and because running is an athletic activity, right? So the other thing that's real, real important with a lot of this is asking the runner how they feel. And she was somebody that came in with, with a little bit of shin pain. And when she went to this different type of style of running, a little bit more of a bounce to her, she actually felt better. She wasn't, um, I think, in, in this particular case, um, creating that transverse rotational force through her shin and, and, and her medial tibia that she was when she was loading with a heel strike uh, initially. So that was just one example of some of the things I look at. Another example is this is somebody from behind. Um, let me make this a little bit bigger, hopefully. If it'll let me. There we go. You guys see that get bigger? All right, let's run this one. Again, things I tend to look at from the rear, um, I look at what I call the knee window, making sure that their knee isn't going into too much valgus um, from step to step. Um, again, this person is marked up because we were going to do a 3D analysis right after it with Doug's system. But it, it is a little bit hard to truly get on the landmarks that we're looking for there. Um, it is hard to kind of measure some of those joint angles. Um, I, I'm looking grossly at what's happening one side versus the other with regards to pelvic drop. Um, but what I like to really concentrate here is, again, arm position. And I like to look at rear foot position, too. I look to look at the amount of pronation, how long they're going in through pronation, and the rate of pronation. Those are all things that I like to at least get an example of. And what I'll do is I'll do it um, in, in a situation where they come in running a certain way. And then what I'll do is I'll have them maybe change some of their mechanics and see what that looks like in, in relationship to the, to the prior running position. So again, somebody that excessively pronates can be problematic, but also somebody that pronates fast and is stuck in that pronated position for a long period of time as their foot's in contact with the ground, like she is, like she pronates and she's stuck in that position for a really, really long time, in my opinion. Um, and you can see that her foot goes into this, uh, more, her rear foot actually goes into this more of uh, an everted position um, than more than I would like it to, but she's kind of in this, if I can maybe play with this video here a little bit, let's see. She's in this position, it's not gonna let me go really slow. Yeah, she's not going to let me slow it down on this video. But she's in that position right there for a pretty long time. Um, so, again, that would be something. I don't have the before and after any changes here. Just wanted to show, like, some of the things I look at from behind. And then this is an example of a really skilled runner, in my opinion. This is one of my UF guys. Runs really, really well. Um, I'll let you guys judge. So I'm showing his forward trunk lean there. looks really nice. I don't know what that second blue arrow is. I just kind of showed up on the screen, but we got rid of it. Like I said, I really like that forward lean there. He's not leaning at the waist. It's more, more through his ankles. His foot contact. I think I slow it down. You can see he's landing relatively neutral at the, at the foot. I don't know what I'm doing here. Let's see. Let me play that one again. So again, landing pretty close to his center of mass, good trunk lean, knee position looks really good, tibial position looks really good. Extends a little bit far in his backside. Um, you know, what we don't want to have happen is we don't want a truly extended hip knee and ankle at terminal stance. Um, we call that the extensor paradox. I think people get stuck in that backside mechanics too long. So what I like to cue is I like people to cue that when their foot hits the ground. What I really want them to do is think immediately of getting their heel off the ground. I really want them to think about cycling and landing underneath their center of mass as quick as we can. Okay, I do have some, some slow pictures here. So his foot inclination angle, his tibial inclination angle, his knee flexion, you're going to all see these measurements here.
So again, closer to that 30 degrees of knee flexion. Again, we're talking ballpark here. And this is all on the app that's the, the on form app. So what I'm doing here is I'm bisecting both of his femurs, drawing the line straight up and looking at what that gives us in terms of his, his um, hip separation angle. So again, I look for roughly below 30 as, as, my, as my goals there. All right, so that's just a really quick down and dirty in you know, 2D analysis in a couple of minutes here um, of just some of the things that I like to look at. Again, a lot of people will look at knee valgus. They will look at rear foot inversion and eversion, the amount that they'll, they'll measure that through their, through their shoe. I don't know how accurate that is. I have a hard time really kind of looking at the accuracy of that. I'm looking at big changes, and again, my changes I'm trying to make are more, more sagittal plane stuff. Because again, I do believe that the sagittal plane is easier and better at um, grasping and measuring some of those 2D um, um, measures, joint measures. And I think you're going to see a lot of carryover as to by making changes, getting people to land with a more neutral foot, getting people to land with a more vertical tibia, getting people to land with a more flexed knee, getting them to land closer to their center of mass, getting them on and off the ground a lot quicker. I think you will see the decrease in the amount of pronation and the rate of pronation as a result of that. Um, and I think also the pelvis and the hip area will be a lot more stable because they're not asked to absorb shock quite as long. So that's my down and dirty in like three minutes as to why I do what I do. That was three minutes, Chad. <laughs> Just kidding, Scott. Uh, <laughs> three minutes. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. No, it's good. And and don't get me wrong. Like 2D is is something that I will use as well. I want to get to people's questions and and things like that and hear what you guys are looking for. Like my opinion is that 2D and there's a lot of research behind this. 2D is is really for um, qualitative and 3D is for quantitative. Uh, I wouldn't trust any numbers, even, you know, Scott does a great job. Scott's one of the best in the world at doing 2D, but, you know, his his angles, we were seeing there, they're just not at the center of axis of rotation. And the numbers are more just like kind of a, a little bit um, of a uh, guide ball, for him, but ballpark. it's good. Yeah. Ballpark. Yeah. It's a ballpark. Um, so like using, and just remember that, right. There's um, the studies that have looked at these things. There's, there's inter-rater reliability, but there's also a difference between, accuracy and reliability with some of those things. So just don't overstate it. Like I use 2D in my practice as well. Um, I will look at somebody, I'll put them up there to give them a little feedback and it, it can be useful there. Um, you know, just, just- It's a great teaching yeah. tool too. It's a great right. teaching tool. You know, you draw some angles on, on a runner, they can visualize what you're looking at. You can educate them on what you're trying to see. And then you can look at side to side images with different angles on there and say before and after kind of stuff, and they can visualize what you're looking at. And again, we're not looking at, and I always tell them like, just because one says 29 and the other one says 28, doesn't mean that it's 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 better or the same. It's just, it's, it's you're Unless looking, it's like Doug said, qualitatively, <laughs> what's that? Unless it's 3D and then you can see, uh, Unless, yeah. <laughs> then you can yeah. see actually yeah. the difference, yeah. Yeah. Correct, correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's good. I, I think that is, and um, you know, there is clinical utility for 3D. And if you're really looking to get accurate information, I would encourage you, like, you should pursue a 3D system. If you're looking for some feedback um, to your clients that you'd like to give, then you can utilize some of that. But um, you know, just know what the system and tool is designed for. But at the end of the day, Scott and I will say, just look though, like, please look and please get them on the treadmill and make sure gait analysis, I can't stress that enough. You know, I love that at least a quarter of the people on here had said that they had done a gait analysis in the last month. And that's what we really need is we need you like doing it more and getting skilled. Scott is, you know, one of the most skilled in the world at doing 2D analysis, right? Um, 
and you know he's going to see things that other people aren't and you got to get reps and you got to get practice and the only way to do that is to start um and you know having a systematic approach and how you look at it is helpful that's what scott and i teach in in the courses how to break it down and make it um relevant to that runner so um and we're not here to talk about gate modification and gate changes and all those wonderful things right because we can spend days and days and days talking about you know all yeah. our different cues and and what we're really striving for and how we're going to get from a to b and and does this correlate with that and this type of injury what do we typically typically see and 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 does this always relate to that and the answer is usually no but you know there's a lot of different things out there and we classify gate characteristics in in five different ways basically in basic terms right you know typically you see overstriding and collapsing type of mechanics some people bounce you know, some people don't activate their glutes. Um, you know, there, there, there's the uh, people, you know, weave too much transverse rotation. So we have all these gate classifications, right? Um, and, and how do we qualify and quantify those and, and who falls into what category and what category is more important to deal with first and second and third and all that's, you know, big, that's all big stuff, right? But we all know by looking at the research and some of the low hanging fruit out there, we know that, you know, cadence manipulation is a big thing having people, you know, give them cues to land softer, land, or land closer to their center of mass, you know, all of those, you know, internal versus external cueing is, is obviously a hot topic as well. You know, we can go on tangents about all this stuff, but really the main thing of today was to know that, you know, 3D is definitely a viable option if, you're, if your pocketbook can handle it, right? It's, it will give you great information. Um, 2D is something that we all can do and we all should be doing it rather than doing nothing. And there is good information you can get from 2D, I think, both from the clinical perspective as well as from patient buy-in perspective, which is very, very important, patient education as well. Um, you know, you have to sell yourself as a knowledgeable person on running mechanics. And without the patient being educated on what you're seeing, I think you kind of fall short. So if you can show them what you're seeing and talk through it and understand, and have them understand what your goals are, I think you get patient buy-in and they think that they're talking with somebody that really knows running. So that's, I think both great. systems have their... Go ahead, Scott. Sorry. No, I was going to say both systems have their pros and cons, but I think you just got to know what those are and then kind of go from there. So what I'd love to do right now is open this up to the residents and the faculty members on the call. Um, what I'd love to have you do, if you if you want to unmute and talk, please raise your hand first and I'll call on you. If you just want to throw a question in the chat, that would be great. Um, and while you start typing your chat questions, I want to start uh, for Scott. You mentioned a couple kind of key pitfalls when setting up 2D motion analysis. You mentioned making sure you have the right app. You mentioned making sure you have the right distance, ideally a stable surface. If you could just one more time go through what you think are the key errors you see when people try to initially go through 2D analysis, I think that would help a lot for the for the people on the call. Sure. I think I think the first thing is making sure you have the space to do it, right? Making sure you have room around your treadmill. And again, a treadmill is, is probably where I would do it. Making sure you're on a treadmill or have room around your treadmill in in as many of the of the um, front back sides as you possibly can, right? Um, bare minimum, I would want a front and a, a side and a back. Bare minimum. Again, I do most of my work from the side, but again, I do like looking at the back. Um, so that's that's one. Space around your treadmill. Two, um, I really do like using a tripod if I can, because again, you get a very consistent, very level um, uh, video which again, you're only as accurate as your setup is, right? And we know that 2D isn't super accurate to begin with when compared to its counterparts, 3D. So if you are consistent with your setup every time, you're going to only improve the accuracy and the consistency of what you're looking in day at day in, day out. So, you know, tripod, same distance or, or a consistent distance from the treadmill at the same, we'll call it viewing, uh, viewpoint, whether it be zoomed in a certain level or zoomed out a certain level, try to be consistent with that in your camera settings, I think would be very, very helpful. Um, again, 60 frames per second or greater would be my bare minimum uh, of where to, where to go with um, from that. Um, again, how much of the person you want to get in the video, I think is important. Ideally, you get the whole person in the video, ideally. 
Um, but there are certain situations where you saw like I only got like, you know, three quarters of them in and that's not ideal. But again, for making bigger changes, I find that, you know, the lower body bears most of the brunt of what we're dealing with. Right. So, again, first visit, second visit, if I deal with something in the lower half of the body, chances are uh, on the video, at least now, again, I'll be watching them so I can see if there's something I want to get a, a bigger picture of, you know, from their upper body, their posture or whatever. You can always do that. But um, that's the ideal situation, full body. But if you need to just, you know, cue in on the foot, sometimes I'll do that, too. Sometimes I'll, I'll get a full body and then sometimes maybe from the from the rear, I'll actually zoom in and, and move my tripod down so that I'm really in line with the with the rear foot and I can get a good a good um, visualization of what's happening in that plane of motion. So I think that's important too, knowing what you're after. So yes, if you're standing and you got the camera at waist level, you get a good picture of the body, know that you'll be looking down at the foot, look at you'll be looking up at the torso. So some of that may play tricks on your eyes a little bit. So getting as close to the line of sight and the plane of sight that you're looking for is only gonna help you out in this. Um, I think listening, we talk about 2D versus 3D, but our ears are super, super important when we're dealing with runners. So try to map out what you see and what you hear. And again, so much of what we do in, in physical therapy as a whole is hypothesis testing, right? We hear something that doesn't sound right, quote, air quotes, right? We see something that doesn't look right. What does that look like, right? So when we say something doesn't look right or doesn't sound right, what what is right? Like what is the, the standard we're trying to set? But making sure that everything kind of coexists together and the picture um, is told, that the story is told by all of your senses, what you hear and what you see, obviously, you shouldn't be smelling stuff, but if you do, that's a problem. Um, but that's all of really, make sure the air is well lit so the camera can pick it up again. Um, i trying to think what else I'm missing, but that's that's really it. The, the, the standardization great. and good visualization. Thank you, Scott. Now, Alvin has raised uh, their hand. Alvin, feel free to um, unmute and ask a question. Yeah, uh, thanks for sharing everything with you guys. I just had a quick question, just kind of clinically, how uh, either of you kind of approach, I guess, the change of like going into a runner, to asking them to change their gait, kind of, or you know, looking at their gait modification. Because uh, the athletes I've worked to range from like high level high school and college to marathoners, and um, the marathoners honestly are the harder ones to work with when it comes to you know, I've been running this way for 20 years. I'm a Boston qualifier. Um, you know, like I'm just hurt. I don't need to change the way I run. And, and honestly, it's hard for me to argue whenever, you know, their times are very impressive and on both sides of things, you know, with the, you know, with the high level college guy coming in, running a sub four mile, you know, who am I to say you should run differently? Um, how do you guys approach that? I guess, clinically, um, you know, saying like, Hey, this, I can see on my 3d analysis or my 2d analysis is wrong, but you know, with somebody that's saying that I'm not going to change the way I run, that's only going to drop my time. Yeah, I um, I might jump in first here and like yeah, a couple of good questions in there actually, you know, about getting buy in and things like that. It's um, at the start of the course, it's kind of teach. A lot of times we ask people to, you know, hey, raise your hand if you had a runner with no pain, would you change their gait if you notice something? And you know, th that's a highly debatable thing. And about half of people raise their hand and half people won't. By the end of the course, most people raise their hand when we ask the question again. Um, just, you know, it's a little bit of the, what got you here won't get you there. And at any point, somebody is able to participate in running to a healthy standpoint, but we don't know when their life stress or other stresses are going to change. And just if we know that they're doing something that could be placing increased stress on the body and, you know, again, there's not perfect form, but if there's things of those five categories that we were alluding to that we know somebody's doing, we should address that. And I've got examples of, you know, you talk about the fast runners. I took a 358 miler to a 351 doing gait analysis and doing plyometric training with them and working on those things. And it is uncomfortable at first for some people to change their form. And we know that after about two to three weeks, it's going to actually improve and it's going to be less challenging for them. But the biggest thing that I've seen is when you find, we talked about personalization, I showed that in running injury profile. When you find the right cue, they will feel a difference. And more important than the cue and them doing it is when they feel a change in their form, they instantly buy in. 
one of my favorite things to do is when I do a gate analysis, I have them run. The computer has an algorithm built in, so I've got a little cheat code. It kind of tells me where to start. I design the algorithm, but I still listen to it. And then I change their form. And then after I change their form, I ask them to go back and run their old way. And I get like the guy yesterday was like, no, I will never run that way again. I will not do it. You cannot make me run that way again because they feel the difference. So I would say, you know, strive to find that feel that significant difference there. And when you find that, it's not going to happen all the time. You're not going to get that aha moment with every single person that you do, but you should be striving to find that thing that makes a big difference. And then it's not hard for them to make the change. So. I would agree. I would agree. Um, let me just say this. So I work with with elite runners as well at college level. I've I've actually dealt with this with the high, like the most successful college runner probably out there right now. And we've talked about this and and we've there's a time and a place to make these changes too, right? You're not going to make a big gate change in the middle of a season, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to make a gate change right before they're about to boost their mileage up. I think the easiest thing we can we can say or hang our hat on when a runner gets injured is that you know at obviously their way wasn't working perfectly because otherwise they wouldn't be injured right so if we can talk to them and say hey not necessarily this is why you're injured but this is maybe one of the things that could be leading to excessive stress on that given tissue um, and then they you you make a small modification and they feel better I think to me that's the aha that's the sell right there. Um, so I commonly work on on addressing running changes, form changes, even with my asymptomatic runners. It's definitely easier with my symptomatic runners because, again, the buy-in is going to be automatic, automatically there. They're not going to fight you nearly as hard because they're injured. And you can ramp them up a lot easier and a lot slower when they're injured because, again, um, uh, it just makes sense, right? Somebody's hurt and they're not going to get back to running the same volume that they were running when they were uninjured. But um, – but there are times where I will have a healthy runner come in in the middle of a season and say, hey, listen, I'm not going to change anything crazy here. But I just want you to think about this one little cue when you're running and let me know what that feels like. And they're like, yeah, I like that. OK, yeah, great. Do it. No worries. Again, just know that that any change that you make is not without a consequence. So you just got to make sure that their body is strong in those areas that are now going to absorb a little bit more load so that they can tolerate it and handle it. Fantastic. Lena, your hand is up. Feel free to uh, unmute and ask your question. Hi there, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Gotcha. Great. Awesome. Uh, my name is Lena, by the way. I am a resident at Cal State Long Beach under Michael Miller. Uh, thank you so much. This was like such great information. Honestly, I'm stoked to spend a Tuesday, a late Tuesday evening like this. So um, I work with a lot of D1 athletes um, and I'm not a runner for background. Ask me anything about classical ballet, but running is um, out of my wheelhouse. So my question, I have a couple, but I'll leave it to one. My question is um, kind of the idea that you were mentioning, Scott, about intrinsic versus in extrinsic cueing. How do you find is the best strategy for cueing for runners and changing their gait? Because it's such a natural you know, shape to take. And so I'm curious what your strategies are. I know you mentioned kind of looking at the quantitative data together, but if you have any other suggestions on how to cue, I would love to hear. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different things that that I will cue on. And sometimes one cue works for one runner and the same cue doesn't work for another runner. And sometimes one cue works for a runner three weeks after you implemented that cue. And so for whatever reason, sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't, you know. Never, I never tell a runner like squeeze your glutes or you know, you know keep keep your knees apart. You know I won't give them those type of cues. Um, I will use the cues I use a lot. I will like um, you know um, think about riding a bicycle. What does that look like? Think about that 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 picture in your mind. That's what I want your legs kind of doing. Seeing how you do that. So I won't tell them what muscles to activate. Um, Think about the ground being hot and you want to get your like you're running on hot coals. What are you going to do if the ground is hot and you're running on hot coals? You're going to pick your foot up quickly. You're going to withdraw it from the ground. You're not going to push directly into the ground. So those are some of the things that I like to do with regards to cueing because I think the carryover is a lot better. Um, Doug, do you have thoughts on that too? 
Yeah, I'll give one um, kind of perspective on that. Instead of giving some uh, cues uh, that we use, because we, uh, I mean, we teach a 45 minute lab just on all the different cues that we do in, in our course there. So um, one of the things that I think is really important to understand when you're changing form with a runner is that it's different from something like golf. It's different from even something like baseball. When you're doing those activities, those are um, discrete movements where there's a definitive start and end. And it's very it's a lot easier to change somebody that's a discrete movement versus a continuous movement like running where you go from one step to the next to the next to the next. So inherently, there's challenges in changing form. So in other sports, you're able to kind of slow down aspects of the movement pattern in running we lack the ability because you can't tell somebody to pause in midair without them falling on their face. So we have challenges with that. And our way to supplement our gait retraining and our cues is by drills and getting somebody to understand what you're asking them to do. Reducing the demand is an essential part of that. So when we have those categories that Scott was talking about earlier, each category has specific cues and specific drills that go along with that. And when I do a gait analysis with somebody, I see what they look like. I spend five, 10 minutes off the treadmill getting them to feel what I'm asking them to do. Somebody that's got pelvic drop, I'm putting them against a wall and having them understand where their pelvis is in space a little bit. Somebody that's overstriding, we might get them to do some marching. We are really looking at the ability to slow down running as much as we can. And when you're able to do that, we need they're able to understand better. So when you're selecting these cues, try to think about not just the cue of what you do on the treadmill, but the drills that prepare them for the movement that you're asking them to do. Fantastic. Any other questions from the group? I know we're getting to the end of our hour here. What I'd love to do then, um, switch over to the chat as a group. Take a look at the chat. I have added a Slack channel link. So for anyone who wants to stay connected, this part of this is networking. I want you as residents and faculty to connect with other residents and faculty across the country. Um, Slack is a good way to do that. We've just set up a, a Slack channel for current residents resident grads, prospective residents, residency faculty, it's all there. Uh, feel free to take a look, join it if you'd like. Um, we'll be sending, putting content in there and sending out information about the upcoming topics. What I would love to do now is have you type in the chat, please, an upcoming topic that would be really exciting to you, a hot topic that you think would be applicable between Scott, Doug, myself, and all the other uh, residency faculty members on, on this call and in this network. We're sure to find some really, really great speakers to, to come in and um, follow up after Doug and Scott. So in the chat, if you don't mind, type in some hot topics that you think you'd love to hear about. We'll try to get this at least you know once a quarter, if not more frequently. Um, but please, please uh, put your info in there, put your suggestions in there, and we'll get that going. If While you guys, you guys do that, to I want to thank Scott and Doug for an amazing presentation. Thank you for launching this for us. Um, any final questions or parting thoughts from the group, feel free to share. Doug and uh, Doug and uh, Scott, same as well. If you have any parting parting comments for the group, please share those now. Yeah, I just shared my screen. So if you guys have any questions for me, I think you guys can see it. This is where you can find me, whether it be uh, a website, uh, Instagram, I'm pretty good at. Um, we're going to be putting some more stuff on YouTube with this included, hopefully to kind of share the, you know, share, share the word and spread the word about this stuff that Ben... I want to thank Ben for doing this, first of all. I don't think anybody's done that yet. This is such an amazing idea, such a great opportunity to kind of get all you guys, get all of us residency uh, involvees together to kind of share and, and to kind of spread the the uh, spread the word, spread the good word. So again, Ben, thank you for doing this. And again, to you guys, if you have questions uh, for me, anytime reach out, happy to answer any questions I can. Likewise, uh, I'm not as active on social media, but uh, but my company is uh, Run DNA Systems, or uh, I do have Doug Adams PT. Um, I've got three young kids. Sometimes you'll see pictures of them on there. Uh, but we're very active uh, within the Run DNA community. We have our own uh, community there. Um, so uh, feel free to check that out as well. Or um, I'll put my email in the chat if anyone uh, really is is interested in, in getting a hold of me here. 
um, you can uh, email me as well. Pretty responsive there. All right. With that, I'll bid you all good night. Appreciate you taking the time on a Tuesday evening and stay tuned for the next iteration. It will be coming soon and I'll let you guys know. So stay tuned. Thank you guys. Thanks, Dr. Kevin. Thanks for having us, Ben. Thanks, Ben.